prophet Amos, the seventh chapter, beginning with the seventh verse. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, the Lord is standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, and eat bread there, and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people, Israel. Here ends the reading of the Old Testament lesson. O oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments, and how inscrutable His ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. The second reading for this morning is taken from St. Paul's Epistle to the Ephesians, the first chapter, beginning with the third verse. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Here ends the reading of the epistle. Some said John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. 
That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias gave, had a grudge against him and wanted him put to death, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Here ends the reading of the Holy Gospel.
Instead, he gives it to us freely on account of Christ. Jesus, who sacrificed himself on the cross, died for your sins and my sins and the sins of the whole world. That's how God shows his love, that through faith in Jesus, you are saved. And yet even your faith is a gift because God predestined you. Even before the world was made, he knew that he was going to give you faith, that he was going to work faith in you, forgive you your sins, wash away those sins in holy baptism, that he would make you his own child. That's good news. See, good news isn't something that we have to do. Good news is all about what God has done for us. So don't worry when you read big words like that in the Bible. That word predestined means that God, even so long ago, even before Adam and Eve knew what he was going to do for you. And in his name, we have the forgiveness of our sins. Because when you were baptized, what happened? Water, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit poured out on you. And that's no small thing. And since then, what's been going on? You've been hearing God's word where he continues to strengthen your faith. What a blessed thing this is. That's how God blesses us, through word and sacrament. Those are the priceless treasures that Jesus gives his church. You can't buy God's love. You can't buy God's adoption. He gives it to you freely. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we give thanks to you that you have chosen us. We are humble before you because we know that we have done nothing to deserve your love. In fact, we know that we have sinned daily and much and continue to sin. Even, even after we have heard your word, the devil, the world, and our own flesh often leads us astray. And yet, thanks be to you, dear Lord. You have saved us, snatched us from the devil, washed us clean in the waters of baptism, and you have strengthened us with your word and sacrament. We pray, we pray that you would help us to never go astray. In Jesus' name. Grace, mercy, and peace to you, from God our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Beginning on August 20th, 1879, C.F.W. Walter, first president of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, presented an essay on the duties of an evangelical Lutheran Synod to the newly formed Iowa District. The essay was presented at St. Paul's in Fort Dodge, the same church, although not the same building, for my dear wife was baptized and confirmed and received the body and blood of Christ for the first time and where we were united in holy matrimony 106 years later. Now having recently returned from our latest district convention, I can tell you there was quite a difference in the essay I heard given and the one presented by Walter. One lasted an hour and a half and was a dramatized prayer lamenting our inability to witness to young people today. The other, Walter's, was several days long. A solid essay on theology which still bears the test of time establishing for us and for our children what a truly evangelical synod can and should be. In his essay, Walter covered the importance of the Word of God, the necessity that our pastors subscribe unconditionally to the Book of Concord, and how the congregations and pastors are to relate to one another, standing together on the truth of God's holy and errant Word and our Lutheran Confession. Both his essay and his book on the proper distinction of law and gospel, our first synodical president warns the pastors that if you would keep the congregation happy, never preach the law. He says that, oh yes, if you want to make friends and keep peace in your church, 
Never call the congregation to repentance, and never hold the mirror of the law up before their faces. Instead, instead of pointing out sin, tell them nice moral stories. Give them practical advice. That's if you want to keep the peace and have a good retirement, says Walter. But he goes on to warn pastors this as well. While you will have a peaceful life going that way, you will also be guilty of being a false shepherd and one who does not openly care about the word of God or love the flock. How can Walter say such things? Is it just because he was a stodgy old German who lived so long ago? Come on, isn't the church today be a place to avoid conflict? Isn't the church a place to be inspired, to go out and do things in this world, and to leave feeling good about ourselves and what we are to do and have done? No. Not if it means ignoring the truth of God's word or turning a blind eye to sin. Walter writes, the church cannot be built up in peace. For it is located within the domain of the devil, who is the prince of this world. Accordingly, the church has no choice but to be at war. It is the ecclesia militans, the church militant, and will remain such until the blessed end. Whenever a church is seen to be not ecclesia militans, but ecclesia quiescens, that is, the church of ease. And you may rely on it. It is a false church. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, please don't misunderstand me. We are not to seek out conflict. We are not to revel in conflict or the thrill that the drama of conflict brings. Neither the called servant of Christ, me or pastor, or you, the congregation, are to go out of your way to intentionally create conflict in the church. And yet we know because of the devil of the world and our sinful flesh, conflict will find us. So rather, we are to do as the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. He urges us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, and to not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. St. Paul says, let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, clamor, and slander be put away from you, doing everything without malice. So be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, the Apostle writes, be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love as Christ loved and gave himself up for us as a favorite offering and sacrifice to God. So we're not to see conflict. That is true. But on the other hand, neither are we to desire to have our ears tickled for the sake of only hearing what makes us happy, affirm our emotions, or builds a false sense of security in our good works or feelings. For St. Paul warned Pastor Timothy, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. I know I'm weak in that area. I often grow impatient. I desire quick fixes. And yet, we must abide by the word of God. For the Apostle Paul says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but instead having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and want to be this. So let me ask you, Dear baptized. If it was true in the time of the apostles and prophets, do you think these warnings are still relevant for us today? 
Or do you think that we know God's word so much better in America today than the prophets such as Amos did? Amos, who called the people to turn away from their false idols. Do you think we know the word of God better than the preaching of John the Baptist against adultery, fornication, or the admonition of St. Paul to avoid false teaching? Do these things still apply to us? Or have they been overturned because our world has gotten so much better? Do you think that we are so much more knowledgeable of God's word than our forefathers were? So much more dedicated to the doctrines and teachings of the Book of Concord. So much more committed to the Christian faith in our daily living that we no longer are tempted to reject the truth and therefore no longer need to heed or hear its warnings? Of course, the answer is a resounding no. Throughout the ages, from the time of the apostles and prophets such as Amos and the people of Israel rejecting his proclamation, embracing an idol of their own making, a long way of worship of the true God, to the time of John preaching to Herod and countless others calling them to repentance, even at the loss of his own head at the hands of a lecherous king and his treacherous wife and her young dancing girl daughter? I think that the desires of the old Adam and us to water down God's word. Don't we have to deal with the bare bones of God's word and doctrine? To try and live under the law so we can take credit for our own goodness or to avoid the law by only hearing about the most generic of Jesus's has changed? Do we not also need to die a real death to self because of our sin and desire to sin? Just think what Luther said. He said to think this way. That we no longer need to hear the law or the gospel preach the law in all its severity, the gospel and all of its beauty and purity, is to be like a drunk peasant who gets up on a horse and falls off one side and then gets back on only to fall off the other. And so, yes, then as today, the word of God must be preached without any taking to or adding from it, any taking away or adding to it. Instead, Trusting that God's word is the same yesterday, today, and forever, never changing, but always constant, as the prophet Isaiah declared. As a church and a congregation, we must always be prepared to keep the culture, the times, the spirit of the age, the devil, and our own sinful flesh from influencing and affecting what we believe or do not believe. Because no matter how good it might make us feel to try and avoid staring into the mirror of the law, no matter how many people it might drive away from the church by remaining steadfast in pure doctrine and practice, we must never, ever allow these things to slip. And we must also hold one another accountable, not fearing but rejoicing in the promises of God and His peace which the Word and the sacrament alone can give. So here's some more of Blessed Dr. Walther's essay to the Iowa district. You see, some people call it tyranny if a pastor refuses to depart from God's Word. The pastors who depart from Scripture just to preserve peace are under a curse. There are many congregations who rejoice having such a pastor. They say, he's a good man. When we say, pastor, you mustn't do that. You'll just have to overlook that. He doesn't put up a big fuss. He's a good pastor. He lets us do whatever we want. But, beloved, you do not want that kind of pastor because you will be led astray. And we do not want that in these latter days as the temptations to do so because imagine if Amos had refused to proclaim the words of the Lord to Israel, instead fearful of the wrath of the wicked, corrupt, idol-worshipping Jeroboam rather than God. What good would it have done the people if Amos had turned tail and headed back to Tekoa to be a shepherd there and simply doing it for the sake of peace? Imagine if John the Baptist had kept his mouth silent. 
not railing against Herod's adultery of marrying his brother's wife, but instead ignoring the sin and allowing it, as so many do today, only to try and save his own skin. Imagine if Luther had recanted the gospel of the Diet of Worms, or the faithful Lutheran layman had backed down and not represented the Augsburg Confession, or if our own Saxon forefathers, which included Walther, had agreed to join the Union churches instead of standing firm on the Lutheran Confession. This is no different than if a pastor today was not born the people of God, of the temptation and idolatry of allowing anything to come between them and God's word, or take precedence over the hearing, learning, and inwardly digesting of that word. It's no different and just as damning to hear us today if pastors and churches remain silent about the devastating effects of cheating, sex outside of marriage, unscriptural divorce, cohabitation, abortion, or pornography, or just plain, lazy faith that's too busy for God's word. See, preaching against anything contrary to God's law and command is what the church is called to do. And yet the church doesn't stop there, does it? Because the law does not save. And that's why the gospel must prevail. And what gives us peace and comfort and joy is the fact that Jesus was not afraid to fulfill his Father's will, to humble himself, coming down from heaven above, taking on the form of a servant, so that he could suffer and die for your sins and mine, for the sins of the whole world. Because in the end, it's never about feeling good about ourselves. We should never leave this place with our heads held high and a bounce in our step, inspired by what we have done or are going to do. For no matter how good it might make us feel to hear that we've done good works, those good works can never save us. You see, instead, we leave here overjoyed with heads held high and a bounce in our step because of what Christ has done for us in saving us for maggot sacks, as Luther called himself, from ourselves. It's always been, and has always remained, feeling good about what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. That's the truth that the church must proclaim, even though the gates of hell may attempt to prevail against it. Because what has your Lord done that you should feel good about Him? He has given you the truth of His holy, inerrant, revealed word. He's done this so that you might walk before Him in blessedness, just as the Apostle Paul said. And He's given you the promise that your sins have been forgiven, sins which you have committed willingly. And yet the Lord does not hold them against you. Things that would condemn you eternally, the Lord has taken into His own flesh that you might live. In doing so, your Lord has given you the ultimate treasure, the promise of an eternal life, even though we have so often wasted our lives in sin. Your Lord has done that for something as simple as water and the word. He's also given you something else, a foretaste of the peace to come. He's fed you with his own resurrected body and blood so that you might know that your sins are forgiven and that you have an eternal resurrected life awaiting in him. And if all of that wasn't enough to help you leave here overjoyed at what your Lord has done, he gives you this promise to the Apostle Paul as well. He has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. And we should be blameless and holy before him. Not on account of anything we do, but holy on account of God's grace and mercy. See, that's the message which gives true peace and unity to the church, a message which we must never, ever waver from proclaiming. In Jesus' name, amen. May the peace of God which passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ.